Did you ever see that Saturday Night Live skit where it's the the headache tester? It -hmm. was like the test to see. This is from like a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I think Phil Hartman was still on it. So this is how long ago it was. But it was like, would you rather, what's worse, having a headache or not knowing if you have a headache? And it's like this (laughs) whole elaborate test. And it's like, um, you have to like, get like a saliva sample and like submit it and it takes like 12 hours for it to like come through and then you have to like dye it and if the dye is just a little bit off it's this whole crazy thing but it's it's i've been thinking about that the last couple days Mm -hmm. and one of those ways it's like (laughs) yeah good conversation we'll good? have some of it in there I'll yeah okay there. hi everyone and welcome to royal path i'm your host andrew and uh we'll get back to death in just one second but speaking of death in a way i guess because that was one of my answers what was one of the first bands or musical artists that you got like cult like obsessed with like just like instantly like 15 years old maybe like 13 to 15 you found that band and like instantly like you bought all their albums you're totally into them you like got really really into them death was one of mine the band the death metal band death was like one of mine and then also probably tool i really really got into tool pretty hard it took me a while it took me a while to I think develop a a cult like I've got cats fighting a cult like appreciation for any band. I would have to say, um, I guess they qualify as a band, but uh, everything but the girl. So oh. uh, yeah. yeah, electronic yeah. Ben Watt, Tracy yeah. Thorne, mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's, that bring, man, just saying that brings me back. <laughs> when was that cyprian when did you get into them Nine, 90s mid yeah. early to mid 90s but i think they started late 80s yeah my late sister 80s. was really into them yeah they're awesome yeah she's really into them yeah what about you father um was it the misfits it was and i was just thinking about this because technically the the, the litmus for me is i was into pil and just kind of like Johnny Rotten, John Lydon, uh, like first, but I never really, and this was, I know this is the litmus. I never had like posters or books or anything like that. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It was just, that was like PIL. And then the Sex Pistols retroactively was like the first band. I was like, what is this? And I'm like 13. Um, but it, it it's definitely like the misfits, all things kind of Glenn Danzig, Sam Hain. Um, Cause yeah, I mean, I was, you know, hardcore into that, like hardcore, hard, hardcore. So yeah. Mm-hmm. I never really liked the Sex Pistols. I was just like, by the time I got around to Sex Pistols, I was already over it. I was just mm-hmm. like, yeah, I know about Sex Pistols. Yeah, I know, I know. But Public Image Limited, different story. But like, Sex Pistols was not my thing. Yeah, you know, I, I think the thing is, is that, um, and like, I want to be like, oh, an age thing, but I, I don't think it counts in this area because I think I got 10 years on you or something like that, but that's not really mm-hmm. that much to really kind of pull that card. But I do want to say, um, it's not so much the like the time in regards of like the quantity of, of age, but it's just the time in which my mind was able to kind of be aware of certain things and also the time in society. So like, you gotta understand it's like, 
I remember reading about the clash in the newspaper. Okay. You know what I mean, like, right. right. So, so it's it's kind of in the air in a different way. Like, by the time you're aware of it, it's it's like pastiche. It's just like oh, so passe. That's what it's it like, is. That's what it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I mean, for, it's it's like archaeological at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Like for for me, well. And the only reason why I'm, I'm saying no, not quite, because my son is getting into them now, my 15 year old, mm, mm. and for him, it's archaeology. You know what I right, mean? Right, right. For right, for right. Andrew, it would just have been like, oh, that's like so passy, like oh, like you know what I mean? Because it's it's a fresh of enough ghost to be like, yeah, right. we're past that. You know what I mean? It's not it's not old enough to be archaeology. I and, got you. I you know, got you. Because you can appreciate the archaeological exactly because it's far enough away. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. My, like my you. son watching him, like he's going through my albums and he sees my Sex Pistols album. He's like, "What? You got this?" And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah. right." right <laughs> you know, right, right, it's right. Right. So, so that that's that's the thing. But um, it, it really, I mean, everyone can say that, but I think that there's particular moments in time that, that are unique. Mm-hmm. And there was just this unique period in which that the eighties becoming, I think every generation that becomes self-aware, the moment, the moment a generation becomes self-aware, something happens, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. It's like, now mm-hmm. that you're kind of self-aware of where you're at, it kind of changes everything to a certain degree. So at that time that I'm talking about in the eighties, becoming aware of like, cause this is for me, like basically from 84 to 88 is, is this period of time where I'm becoming aware. And I think looking back on it retroactively, I think the eighties and subculture is becoming aware of itself in its own way. It's like this kind of like, um, uh, kind of intersectionality that happened you know what I mean um and it sounds terribly egocentric but I just think it, I just happened to be at that moment you know at, at this kind of zenith of kind of self-awareness for 80s and especially like that subculture um that time because like again like the newness of punk rock it wasn't shock anymore it wasn't like 76 you know to like 82 it's like what is this phenomenon you know so by the time i'm aware of things which is young but old enough to be like okay yeah i see this because of my older sister it's like this is a quote unquote valid you know subculture kind of cultural phenomena people are like you know the rage of the punks and all this stuff and but i i I just think that the that awareness of it is is kind of different because the eighties and all of the excess and everything, it was like this one kind of voice that I was aware of. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't keen to any type of theological or spiritual things, obviously, but, or explicit spiritual things, but that kind of voice pointing the finger at the opulence, pointing the finger Mm. at the, you know, the excess of the eighties, pointing the finger at the, the kind of sterile, cleanness of the 80s you know i mean it's even in the music if you listen to the production of the music it's like oh you know it's it's got this wet sterile kind of like Mm -hmm. production value to it so punk was this and i know people you know we can get into this whole like psyop punk as a psyop all that stuff but like i think at the end of the day it really became this critique that addressed some things that as the decade was closing out people were looking back and being like yeah Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, excess, you know, like all of these things, you know. Um, There's there's an interesting thing there regarding subcultures. And I've been thinking about this a lot as I'm looking at my daughters and then as I'm looking at like, let's say 20 somethings and whatnot. When we talk about sub, I don't think there are any subcultures anymore because everything that I see is aesthetic. It's not participatory. Mm -hmm. right like i was part of all these subs real legitimate subcultures as you as you guys were and part of that was you're not a part of you can't be a part of it at a distance like you have to be in the mix you have to be involved you have to be around people you have to be doing the thing and the aesthetic goes along with that but if you're just doing the aesthetic Mm -hmm. 
and you're not involved, mm -hmm. oh, that's that's wor that's the worst thing that you could be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because, man, God bless you, Cyprian. This is so good because this this opens up. I mean, the hard part now is can we how many rabbit trails rabbit holes can we hit on this one well i was i was hoping it, it kicked one off I for mean, me and i just, said i'm gonna it, fire this up it, it's so <laughs> it's so many right because like number one you know it's like we always need like to keep a tally and like go back and forth it's like number one there's this whole thing with like rites of passage and the absence yeah. of it in western culture right and the kind of like advent the, the kind of laying of this the the stage the the laying of the ground preparing the ground for globalization you know in the, in the nefarious sense of globalization right and and the kind of like homogenization of culture right and the loss of that in the negative sense in the negative sense of it right because there are positive aspects to it that's right that's why it's insidious right so there's that aspect but then there's this whole other aspect too of you know how does this also reflect just the natural progression of man as an individual. Cause there's this whole aspect of like just getting to the aesthetic. And I just think about, cause I've made this, I've made this comparison for people and I think it's lost on some of them because they haven't been through subculture but it's like, I talk a lot about the affect, A-F-F, -F, right? The affect of orthodoxy and people come in and they mimic the affect, which is fine but they just stay at mimicking the affect. And that's a lot like the guy who comes in, you know, and he's like, you know, whatever subculture you're in, it's like, I got all the studs in my leather jacket. I got all the patches on my flag jacket. You're just a little the, bit too clean. You know what I mean? Yeah, too clean. I got, I got the right witch boots, you know? Yeah. I got the right sleeveless shirt. I got the right, like whatever your thing was, right? Whatever your thing was, it was like, you found the store where people got their gear. Yeah. You got it. You show up and it's just like, oh, here's the fresh cut, you know? And, and then it's this process by which you're like, oh, you kind of go through the hazing. You try extra harder. You get hurt, all those things. And then eventually what happens is you, you, you graduate out of freshman to sophomore, right? The sophomore curse kind of hits. It's like, I'm not really whatever. That's where you say I've earned my my stripes because I my sophomore year coming into the scene was tough. You know what I mean? That's where you get your war stories, quote unquote. Sure. You, you move on up. And then like the next step for you as a, as a junior is you're like, hey, here's the new freshman. Hey, look at you. you. You haze the guy who's got the fresh cut sleeveless metal shirt or the spikes or the, you know, the the, the corpse makeup, whatever it is. And then you're the senior and then like, you don't care. And then you're just like, okay, is this really, is this my culture? Am I out? And am I gonna just like go get a job and buy a BMW? And that, and I think that's the same thing with happens to people in orthodoxy. It's like, they get into it. They mimic all the stuff, you know, they, they read all the things, which is fine. Um, but then they, you know, Maybe you, you realize you have your first encounter with a priest you don't like or whatever the situation is. Here's your, you know, I'm earning my stripes, whatever. Then you get into this place where it's like, oh, you know, converts. And I know priests who they're stuck there. I know some priests, they still talk about converts like that. And it's like, sorry, Father, like, don't forget you were a convert one day too. You know what sure. I mean? And it's just like, yeah. so people can get So are stuck. the apostles. So are the apostles. Exactly. <laughs> so are the apostles, you know? So it's like people can get stuck there. Right, they can get stuck, and it, and it's easy because it scratches the ego. It's the way of your badge of like, see, I'm authentic because I see all the foibles of the new guy. But then, God willing, you graduate, and they're like, okay, I this this is my life now. Like, I'm not the church isn't just this kind of phase I went through. It's like, no, I I need to change, and I think that's where people start hitting repentance. That's where people start finding obedience. That's where people start finding the things that connect us to Christ, you know? And it's that trajectory. I mean, for me, subculture was this school, which taught me this kind of like process of initiation, yeah. process of maturity. And it's like, okay, you know what I mean? Great topic. <laughs> the, it, it's interesting because as I look around, like I'm trying to think besides the church i mean i guess there are some other things that people 
go to that are participatory, but it seems like there's very, like there's very few that I can think about. Like obviously sports is one of them, but I feel like there are some specific sports because like, like for instance, I think MMA is probably one of the biggest things right now mm -hmm. because it's the mm -hmm. type of thing that somebody can just roll into in that same way. Like, oh, mm -hmm. you're fresh, mm -hmm. you know, in mm -hmm. here. That means you got to you got to roll with guys who are going to beat you up. And like mm -hmm. this, is, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not like going and like if you want to go and you want to play pickup basketball, you actually have to be able to play basketball. Right. But that's the same with, you know, you're going to go play soccer, beach volleyball, right. you got any of these things. It's like people aren't going to play with you if you can't actually play. Right. But when it comes to MMA, like you can come in fresh, you know, and it's like, you go through the, right. it's a school, like you say. Right. And so it's easy for me to see how that's become a sub -call. I guess fitness in general is probably another one of those weightlifting and that type of thing, mm -hmm. you know, that somebody could come in, but on the, on the, let's say spiritual or intellectual but certainly Christianity, as I, as I've seen it practiced besides orthodoxy, doesn't offer, doesn't offer that. Like it doesn't offer the opportunity to go beyond the aesthetic, certainly something like a non-denominational evangelical. Mm -hmm. It's like, go to church, sing the songs, I guess. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, let me ask what? you a question though, Cyprian. I want to see if my intuition is correct on this, what, what, what are your thoughts on? Um, because it seems to me that evangelicalism in particular, Protestantism has its own kind of thing, but evangelicalism kind of being like this logical conclusion of the Protestant movement, mm -hmm. it's all about removing distinction. Mm -hmm. I think one of the big problems with it, it's all about removing distinction. And I think that's one of the big things like Andrew, I think Andrew, you're the one who said about like, there is no more subcultures anymore. It's like the problem that I see with that, with a lot of this, it's getting back to that globalization thing is like, the thing about subculture was subculture to some, to some degree, and regardless if it's a psyop or not, is an innate desire for distinction. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that distinction is actually like healthy, right? This is one of the problems with wokeism is that wokeism tries to weaponize, a, 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 it tries to weaponize, it tries to invert, it tries to pervert a good natural tendency in regards of identity, right? So identitarian politics, politics are toxic, right? But they're toxic not because people shouldn't want to understand or find identity, right? It's toxic because it's this very noxious mixture of number one, taking identity as an idol, uh, as an idol, putting identity as the as the main essence of a person in the wrong way, right? Because these identities are material, right? They're fallen, they're distorted, they're false, right? They're they're very false, right? That's one problem with it too. But the other problem is that it 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 twists and distorts this natural aspect of distinction to where people it, on the other end of wokeism, it's like this contradiction, it's a madness, the contradiction of distinction. So in other words, the in gender, right? It, it, you see the contradiction in it, right? Wokeism in, in trying to make an idol out of ethnic and racial identity, right? But at the same time, right, the madness of contradiction, removing the distinctions of gender and sexuality. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? And there's a very, yes. yes, there's a very pernicious confusion there. And like, I'm not trying to go into a hyper analysis just for the sake of like entertainment, but I do believe that there's something very, spiritually and demonically there's some there, there's there's something there that's intentional in regard to that contradiction it isn't just a kind of like happenstance i think there's there's something intentionally being or inter not, um introduced into the broader 
to the world well, criti stage. critical theory is what sort of the materialists have mm -hmm. latched onto, right like frankfurt school mm -hmm. all of that right. like what, what came out of socialism for me that's like okay it it's kind of interesting but it's it's not the it thing doesn't though, have the weight it doesn't, doesn't have, have the weight, weight because it. it's still yeah. on a materialist level what i'm talking exactly. about is it does something spiritually to people right yes. so like yes it, it's like a coup it's like the the coup de grace it's like that final death blow to some degree mm -hmm. that i think is our this is what i was saying about the movement of like globalization the movement of the in the in the, all the negative ways right the homogenization mm -hmm. of culture like this is the kind of like final death blow to to set something in, like in order now i think intuitively i would say the low level is transhumanism for it, sure the low level is transhumanism and so we all know that well maybe we don't maybe that's something we go into too right because <laughs> interestingly enough right that's that's where we're at perhaps you know becoming man but like transhumanism is the thing that it's like it's never about the one ism right mm -hmm. the the enemy just wants to destroy mankind out of hatred of god but there are particular isms that I think are more important for us to look at because they are, they, they reveal something very particular, right? So communism, I don't think is, I think communism and capitalism, I think those economic isms, I think they're a distraction, right? Yes. Transhumanism is different. Transhumanism is almost like you start seeing the, the, that's like the white paper. You know what I mean? Like you start seeing what is the real game plan here, right? Antichrist, all that good stuff. But like this, this undoing of being human. And I that's, think- that, Yeah, that's, that's it, father. You know what I mean? That's what communism doesn't do. No, it sets the stage. Communism, yeah. communism sets the stage for breaking down distinction. Mm -hmm. And distinction is a very particular thing, pun intended, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. Distinction is a very particular thing in regards to it, it, it's, we need it. We need it to understand and, and participate in reality. What's well, discernment, right? isn't it? I mean, that's the core Correct. of discernment, right? Is to make a distinction between Correct. one thing and the, between the good and the bad. Correct. Correct. And it, and the, and the absence of it really is in many ways, the process by which you begin to get people, you know, in mass to cease to be able to discern the presence of God. You, you see what I'm saying? Because you can't, you can't experience God outside of the the human matrix. Okay. Well, this leads us to this leads us to exactly. So we've now come to exactly where we are in the creed. We've come to exactly where we yeah. are. It's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were gonna get there. We were always... Thank God. <laughs> I wanted to so, say really quick, but I didn't want to interrupt the flow because there's something really good, but. I think that the thing that makes subculture no longer any type of subculture as I grew up with it is never going to be that again, because one thing that my subculture required was scarcity. Uh -huh. I needed like scarcity. Uh -huh. I need, like, uh -huh. yeah. I needed yeah. to find the things I needed to go and not have the album I was looking for. Yeah. And so I decided to buy something else instead. Yep. And, you know, my friend got that one live album from Japan or whatever. Let's all go over to his al his house and right. you know, we can all just. Right. But right. That well, really the, is the metaverse, the metaverse is the end of scarcity because yeah. it's digital. Yeah. You take everything, you take all the things like you take this table and you make it digital and everybody can have this table at the yeah. same time. Yeah. Yeah. That's the trick. Yeah. But that's, that's the anyway. trick. That was the one thing I wanted to say. So, um, so we had touched on this briefly before, um, but uh, the human being human. So, um, uh, uh, was uh, incarnated the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became man. So we had talked earlier about wanting to specifically stick to and became man. I was wanting to jump forward, but I think that there is actually something pretty important in that it became man um mm -hmm. my takeaway from this was Which, by the way interestingly enough we're just a few days away from christmas yeah i know yes. that I hit like, like three weeks ago i was like we're gonna be hitting 
nativity mm-hmm. right about this time um that it was like two or three episodes ago that it was one of those like oh wow we're gonna be hitting this around nativity so um the the angle that i took away from this and we can start with this but we, we can move into something different um is the fact that and god became man um because that if i understand father and please correct me if i'm wrong most of the ecumenical councils and i think deal with the nature of christ that there's some confusion about god being both god and man right that no confusion challenge challenge i want to make that distinction no confusion there's a challenge there's a christological challenge that the church is addressing. And I, I just want to say that. I don't want to derail you, Andrew. I just want to no, say no, no, no. Derail. I, I think that, like, I use, I use like, the creed is my go-to, kind of like on, on anything, on any type of catechetical level, on any type of, yeah. I, I, the reason for it is because it's, when you understand the creed, not just the creed in of itself as some sort of, like, formula, but also the context in which the church produced the creed through the leading of the Holy Spirit, you begin to have this um, this kind of like legend by which you can read the, the map, whatever map of time you're in, in regards of like society, the spiritual aspect of what's going on. And so understanding that it's not, a, there wasn't, and I'm not trying to, you know, it's not a semantic game with you, but just, it's not so much that there was a confusion, but there was a there was a, a challenge that the church had to address. So what's the difference between the two? Because I want to say when we say there was some confusion, it's it it someone can infer that the, the church was trying to figure things out. That the church was like, well, who is Christ and this and that? The church was never trying to figure that out, right? What it was, was there was false doctrines and, the, and that were sneaking in and that were challenging the orthodoxy of the church. And so the councils were called to put those, put, to put them to rest. Do you see sure. what I'm saying? Yes. So it's just important to understand that because it wasn't one of the problems with the creed and one of the things that the enemy has sown, especially with the advent of the Tower of Babel, this the Neo Tower of Babel, the, the, uh, the internet, is that when people ascend the tower or they descend it and they get into these wormholes of like the YouTube historian guy, the YouTube theologian guy, um, the YouTube pagan guys, and they wanna like throw out all these whack theories about the history of the creed, when you, that in itself is part of the warfare where they wanna present you know, the kind of Dan Brown version of the creed. You, you see what I'm saying? And the reality is, is that the church has always known who Christ is because the church is the body of Christ. The church is where the Holy Spirit dwells in fullness. Do you see what I'm saying? And so it's never a matter of like scratching the head of the church. was never like, well, this and that. Understanding that this issue also gets at a key thing that the devil always wants to undermine, which is revelation. And the creed and the teachings of the fathers is, are not about speculation or pontification in that, in that sense. It's all about revelation, right? The fathers are sharing, articulating, disseminating the revelation that's given to the church, right? Through the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, in, in the Holy Spirit right? Through, by, and in, right? Seeing the light, in the light, through the light. That's how we have to understand all of this, right? Because the confidence is what's needed. The confidence of when when we say, when we we say the creed, when we begin to understand all the Christological um, challenges, right? All, All the things that make up the context in which the creed and ecumenical councils were, were had, we need to have the confidence that it was never about trying to figure it out, but that we are defending, we are preserving the truth that's been revealed. That's why salt 
is that's why we're called to have to be like salt, right? We are salt and light. Light reveals and salt preserves, right? Light reveals revelation, yes. right? And salt preserves, right? So we preserve the revelation that's given. It, it's never about speculation. And you can feel it. You can feel it. When you, when you read something, right? If your discernment is growing, if, if, you, are, if you are authentically repenting, if you are authentic, authentically repenting and praying and being guided by the church and life of the church, what will happen is your discernment will grow. You may not have the discernment of a holy elder, but your discernment as a Christian will grow. And when that discernment grows, you will start discerning between this is authority, this is speculation. And you can feel it even with quote unquote orthodox writers or whatever. You can read something and be like, oh, that's interesting. But it's all, as we say at the Laguma, it's all like kind of like speculation, whatever. Versus you read something like, oh, no, this is truth, right? This is revelation. This is, you feel the, the authority of it. Are you following what I'm saying? So this well, is super key, super key. This just happened to me actually this afternoon. And then I text because I was kind of looking up some stuff. And I am not going to say where I found this site. And I texted Father after I read it for just one minute. And I said, Father, please remind me never to go to the internet for anything having to do with orthodoxy ever again, except for this, this channel right here. Um, <laughs> but I, I just, I, I read it and that's what it was lacking. Vile filth, vile filth, like absolutely, you know, and the URL was orthodox and everything. It was just like vile filth. And I read it for about five minutes and like literally disturbed my soul afterwards. I was like, oh, I'm disturbed. Like this bothers me. I have to stop reading it. And it didn't feel like authority to me. It felt like a guy with a hair up his butt, like mm -hmm. in a basement, typing and typing and typing and typing. Mm -hmm. And like, who is it even for? Because it was one of those sites that had like a counter at the bottom of like how many people have visited the site. And oh it was boy, like they still have those? I do. That's you, still a thing. <laughs> it's it's bad. It's like the early internet. There's like a globe, oh like boy. rotating on the site, and it's like it looks oh like er, like late '90s, like you whatever. Anyway, um, it didn't feel like authority. I forgot what I had to say about that, so I'll end it there. But that it was um so bad that like I had to take a step back and be like. I can't do this anymore. I can't because there's no authority there. It's just like, why would I go there? And like, yeah, there's some good stuff out there, but it's like that Tower of Babel. Twice, yeah. twice this week, at least twice, but it feels like it might have been more. I have run across people in my general circle who different things, different pieces of content who are who are in my circle and who are in my circle in like to some degree on the spiritual end of it, who are sharing and seemingly impressed by like Gnostic things that are like yeah. very bad. Yeah. What, what I, what I called when I, when I saw it, I called Gnosticism plus schizophrenia uh -huh. because it's so it's one of these where like the person is, making all of these word connections in different languages of things that just kind of sound similar and don't have like mm -hmm. even going that far and drawing and i'm like yo this is and you and you can feel like they're trying to talk about these spiritual things but of course they end up with the archons and the demiurge mm -hmm. and all of these gnostic things and it just seems like it's interesting to see that when somebody starts that process which i started myself at a certain point in my life mm -hmm. right when you start this process of the analysis it's not coming from revelation you're reading something and you're putting things together and you're doing this and it's like even if it comes together very nicely if you continue doing that even if maybe you're onto something at the beginning mm -hmm. like you're onto a kernel of something perhaps the longer you go you're gonna get right to gnosticism every single time you're gonna be like oh yeah Demiurge, archons, it's simulation theory. They're all the same thing, right? That it's like all these things, that, and then there is no God, mm -hmm. and Christ was never in the body. Right. And that's, and that's, and that's and, yeah, it's demonic. 
And yeah. that, that's literally where it's like, and again, because I realize it's like, yeah, there's some cats who could probably just superficially glance at what we do, how we talk, whatever, and be just like, oh, you know, like, you guys think you're like the Orthodox Ghostbusters, always talking about demons, whatever. But like, just to be clear, for me, I want to make a distinction for everybody for the sake of posterity. Like, yeah, maybe you could point everything does end up kind of coming back from this place, the demonic, but like, I think the thing is, is like, there are things that let's just say are so explicitly demonic versus just the imagination of a, of a, of a person who's not sober. You know what I mean? And, there, and one of the ways you can discern that is when that trail ultimately leads you to this place of denying the incarnation, which is antichrist. Yes. Right. That's that the denial of incarnation of, excuse me, excuse me, the denial of the incarnation is antichrist, like fundamentally capital T, capital I, meaning God becoming man is antichrist and anything that leads you down that to that place that's where it's coming from versus like the sci-fi musings of some guy who's you know had too much coffee now the other side of that though which i think is also really important for us to address is that when we look at these tendencies now for people to um not simply just be exposed to these quote unquote theories, but expound them, right? To like, everybody has a platform now, right? And as soon as, you know, just the medium itself of reading something, you know, the light from the screen and you're reading it and maybe there's a face attached and a voice to it, which gives it weight. And we've been conditioned to, when you see someone on the black, on the black screen, the TV back in the day, it's like, if someone was on TV, just the fact they were on TV made them something, right? I mean, authority, authority. An authority figure, yeah. You know, and it's just like, I don't know. I don't want to get into a whole like, you know, Big Brother thing, right? And like the video screens and all that stuff. But like, there's something to that, and it, and I think again, there's a weird disembodiment that that has really come to the forefront with all of this which is that's a key thing of Gnosticism is this disembodiment and the kind of proliferation of video screens and just nothing is, everything is, <laughs> everything is, is, is hyper focused and hyper detailed in regards to false identity, but at the same time, there's no distinctions, right? These, yeah. these two extremes pulling at the seams and tearing people apart. And, and that breakdown is its own kind of like mass psychosis, right? Getting back to this, like, you know, like you, you commented on this issue with like, you know, it's this kind of like schizophrenia. It's like these, these things are all pushing us to really become disintegrated. Like dis, like yes. the opposite of integration, yeah. right? Disintegration. And that's the primary work of the church for the human being is to integrate man is that man would become integrated because that was the intention that's that excuse me that was the state in which man was created right the fall call causes the disintegration and so now the church works on reintegrating man the the person of man and then god willing once that happens then that process of growing begins you what are what saying? are we integrated with? What so so we so Adam is there? Is he's integrated with the rest of creation? No, Adam is Adam is is integral, and he's whole. Okay. He's integral okay. and he's whole, and on not only within himself but in his relation with God. Aha! Uh -huh. Right, the fall happens, and man Adam's separation from God, right causes this reaction of the, the, the disintegration of within himself, right? So the fall, if the, the fall causes this disintegration, this separation between God and man, man and the angels, man and creation, man within himself, right? And so, this is what the Gnostics are inverting 
this by is, saying yes. it's God's fault and the angel's fault and they're evil because they've yes but they, even they created us disintegrated or something yes but like but even even beyond that they will even go as far i mean like the body is a cage it's a right, prison yes. you got you got yes. to escape it right that in itself is problematic right and so this process of us becoming human right mm -hmm. means that we first must be integrated within ourselves right mm -hmm. and this is that purification process right that purification process gets you to the place where you are no longer a, a a vessel this this you know jar this clay jar that's broken in pieces right you become you know the refusing of the pieces has to happen and then once that happens and you're able to hold water then illumination begins right you start being filled with the insight from the life of the church repentance and all those good things right that that's the that's the process and and once you do that then you can start now you know uh, becoming united with god in, in a deeper way but this is this is one of the big problems with evangelicalism you know this is because it doesn't address this it doesn't address what happens in the fall right it yeah. really it fundamentally doesn't you need this we need this integration right this is why it also it can't be moralism because moralism doesn't address the disintegration between the mind and the body. You know what I mean? And, and is and this redemption? Is this is this redemption? Is the integration redemption? Are they the same thing? Where's the, where's the difference? So salvation, right? Salvation, redemption, like same thing, right? This is the process. This is the means the by which salvation okay. happens, right? Because and this is a recovery of our of, of our nature from of being, before the fall. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. And and this is why, you know, people's understanding of salvation they they don't understand that salvation isn't about you acting or doing something differently or even going somewhere, right? It it's it's about your state of being. And, and that state of being and your connection, find yourself in the life of Christ. Like you need to have this process of integration to happen to whatever degree. Do you remember the onion video, right? <laughs> Let me give like a little yeah. dive on the onion yeah, video, right? Of course. But like, if you remember, so like, you know, the guy, he's like, hey, you know, I have this great opportunity to interview almighty God, right? And then boom, God shows up and like, ah, you know, I'm sorry, right? So. So the thing is, is you can, this is what happens to the Gnostic, right? This, on one hand, like, this is what happens. Someone comes in there flippantly. They think that they're going to like, oh, I'm going to get an interview with God. There's no reverence, right? There's this kind of like trying to approach this P on a peer level, right? And I, and, and I get it. Like it, it's, it's satire, you know what I'm saying? But I just want to use it, kind of give an example, right? When you try to approach God for uh, uh, as, as, and, and I see this, I have good friends who they're these you like perennialists, universalists. They think they're above every tradition. You know what I'm saying? And then this, this is how they approach God, right? It's like the mystery, the mysticism. But like the fact of the matter is, is you're, you are, <laughs> you're approaching life. And, and in that sense, you can't contain life. But really why that is, is because the integration of the self is only possible in relation to him. And what I mean by relation, I, I mean the pun there. In relation to him, not just like you being God, I mean, excuse me, him being God and you being man, him being uncreated and you being created, that relation, but I also mean relationship, relation to in regards of like beloved and loved, loved and beloved right? Because that aspect of it, it's another reason why yoga and all of this Western approach to like Eastern, Far Eastern thought, Hinduism is poison. Because this non-personal aspect to God, it's poison and it's demonic, right? It is this kind of like, it's an objectification of, of the divine, right? And it necessarily prevents salvation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like it's, it's, it's a, it's a barrier. 
Absolutely. It's a, it's a barrier to salvation. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's interesting because it's like this. I'm seeing that this is the exact. I'm seeing that transhumanism and Gnosticism are basically the same thing. And I'm understanding like transhumanism is the, let's say the, the manifestation of the program of Gnosticism mm -hmm. because they have the same presupposition. Like this, mm -hmm. the presupposition is yes, you, you're created, but your creator is evil mm -hmm. and created you in a way that you are destined to suffer and your creator wants you to suffer and that the only way to get free is to become something other than what you were created to be. Mm -hmm. And ah, here are the tools to do this. Mm -hmm. or, or understanding that you actually can supplant the creator and now you are in the control you are the one right. like, and this is this is where transgenderism especially in particular how quote unquote empowering is it to say i'm going to be my i i'm going to truly create myself in my own image how i how i see fit now like i li i i i am literally going to transform my body into how i see fit you know what i mean beyond the parameters of, of what is given. You, you see what I'm saying? So it, it, it's fascinating to me because it's, and, and this is where we need uh, real time. You can, you can help hash out the analogy here because yeah. it's almost at like, I don't understand, I don't know programming well enough, but it's, it's almost like Gnosticism. It's like transhumanism is the software. Mm -hmm. But the way, but the, the hormones, the, um, the, the, the ideology, the indoctrination manifesting through type and print and video, mm -hmm. that's like the hardware, the surgeries are the hardware, right? Mm -hmm. But behind all of it, right, is the thought and the idea is maybe the program and like, it's the pro it, it's the it's the programmer maybe right that that develops the software which has yes. been at play for a long time that software yes. has been at play for a long time and what we're seeing now is the hardware and, and the fruit of it if that i don't know if that's a proper analogy i don't know computers well enough but like you can see how this is yes it's taken this step forward right because it's like mm -hmm. look i have this idea and i want to like get this idea across well depending on my disposition, I may sit on it for five minutes, I may sit on it for five years, but there's this point in time when I have to kind of map the thing out, right? And I will begin kind of like writing the code and putting it together and like getting the operating system going, right? And then once it's done, then people can now use my idea and things, be yes. like, things begin to happen now because now the system and the machine is, is, is built, right? So- And it's why all of these things, it's, this, is, this is awesome because it's, you know, I've been talking about the Church of Woke, but I had never, I don't think that I had really put it together with Gnosticism. I had said mm -hmm. like, ah, oh, it's, it's, it's a church, it's there, but it's like, no. Yeah, it's neo-Gnosticism. It's, it's right, yeah. it's right in line. It's like, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Because the presuppositions are all the same. Well, and think then, about and it then this you way. can see how they all come together. All they the do. pieces, how they all come together of all the different, whether it's climate, gender, right. uh, race, right. Uh, right. transhumanism, right. the metaverse, all right. of that. You see it and it's like, oh no, they're all part of the Gnostic. Right. They all have the because, same presuppositions. Because the thing is, ultimately, it's about this Luciferic idea of like, no, I will be like the most high. Mm -hmm. I will be God. So whether it's going to be, I'm, have, I'm going to have omniscience because I can get on the internet and look at anything at any time I want. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that's, and by the way, that that is assigned by the transhumanists, by the church of woke, that is just seen as an automatic good. Mm -hmm. Right. They're un like un unchallenged. Yeah. Unchallenged. Because, because it's no, it's good that you can see right. absolutely right. anything that you want. And it's right. like, Right. Is it good that right. anyone can right. see anything that well, they want to see here, here's, at that moment? Like here's the thing, because this gets us back to this whole thing of like part of the way that transgenderism is really able to move now is you have to undermine the structures, parents and children. 
a parent who says, no, I don't want you looking at this yet, right? Oh, why not? You know what I mean? It's like these sick, disgusting, perverted, demonically driven people who are putting transgender stuff into Blue's Clues and all this stuff, right? Like that is all about, we're coming for your kids and all this stuff. Like that is so demonic, right? And those types of controls, right? Or I should say the undermining of those structures, right? This is the only way it's possible because what you need to do is you need to unfetter the natural order to to an even greater degree. It's it's in some in some regard it's like, it's almost like a mass MK ultra thing because it's like you need to continue you need to actually break down the natural order of how the person works so that you can now implement and stamp your own twisted processes and develop this get a twisted baptismal name from it too. Sorry, Excuse you get oh. a baptismal name from it too. Yeah, that's true. When you like when you enter the transgender area or era or whatever, you pick your own new name. Yeah. You get a baptismal yeah. name. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, it's literally so antichrist, right? Because it's in the place of. It's in, it's in the place of. And all of these things are inversions of what the life in Christ gives you. All of it is this perfect one for one inversion and, and, and mirroring this per, and perversion of what the life in Christ means for a human being, what it means for God to become man, right? So instead of following the life of Christ, who is the, he is the blueprint, right? He is the second of, of Adam. Integration, of perfect integration. Yes, he is the second Adam. He is what we were and are intended to be, right? So, no, 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 don't follow that, follow this, right? Because following the life of Christ, that is how you become truly human, and that is salvation, right? Not humanism, right? Because humanism is, is demonic, right? It's, it's humanism is like human as, as, the, as the, the litmus of all things, right? It's luciferic. Becoming human means becoming like Christ, right? And that's why I'm, I'm going to throw something out there for people. I'm going to give a little curveball. That's one of the reasons why we, we have to reserve the judgment for Christ. So when we talk about we don't judge, right? Oh, I, oh, I inspect fruit. I'm going to inspect your fruit. You know what I mean? Like, not only because I'm a priest, but also just as an Orthodox Christian, I'm called to have discernment. I'm called to inspect your fruit. I'm a, I'm, yes. If you got bad fruit, Jack, you got bad fruit. You know what I mean? But I'm not going to judge. And so when we say judge, and the reason why as, as Christians, you know, Tupac got it wrong, sorry. When we say we don't judge, only God can judge, what we mean is the final judgment. That's what we're talking about. But we're going to inspect some fruit. And if the fruit is bad, guess what? It's bad, Jack. We're, and we're going to leave that. We're going to let the Lord take the trash out. That's what we do. Yeah. The Lord takes the trash out, but we inspect the fruit, right? But the reason why I want to bring that up, though, is because this is one of the reasons why, on the other hand, we don't need to fall down into the error on the right hand of, like, the Puritans in Salem. Because the devil is in Salem, right? So the yeah. devil's in Salem. You see what I'm saying? The devil's incarnating in Salem but the thing is is Christ is absent there in the true sense so the fall to the right happens and so the judgment is is given in the wrong sense are, are you following me yeah so we can we can look at someone we can go like well if someone's like driving in a car by themselves with a mask on you're like that's kind of silly yeah I mean it's bad fruit whatever but like the thing is is like what I want what I want to get to on that point was we don't judge someone's eternal disposition. That's, that is a loan for Christ to do, right? So I can look at it and go like, hey man, you know, this, this, and this, and this, I'm expecting your fruit, you're denying Christ, all this stuff, okay, that's fine. But ultimately like you're in God's hands. You see what I'm saying? And that's another reason why on the positive end of it, I can look at someone and be like, well, 
if God is, if they're responding to the light that Christ has given them, and they are in the process of integration and becoming more human, right? And what we mean is that's not a subjective thing. When we talk about becoming more human, that's not subjective. It's not like my standards of being human. It's not Andrew's standards of being human. It's the church's standards of being human. And the church's standards of being human are laid out because the church is the body of Christ. Do you see what I'm saying? And there's no confusion in that body, right? That's a whole nother aspect in transgenderism, which is like the confusion. I'm so confused. I felt this way my whole life. I haven't felt like myself in my own body. That's a spirit. And it's a spirit that's disseminated. And you see it. You see little 15-year-old girls, 13-year-old girls getting on the internet, touching the wrong places, hearing the stuff. And all of a sudden, now they're confused. Now I've always felt like I was a man in a woman's body. Do you see what I'm saying? That is a suggestion. That's part of the spell in of itself. Because now people are like, well, what's happening? It's in the water. It's the EMFs. It's this and that. Well, sure, maybe it is EMF. Maybe it's in the water, but it's a spirit primarily. And it's causing people to be like, what's going on? Well, that's a direct kind of in mass spell. It's a, it's a yes. curse because the body of Christ is not confused. Christ is not confused, right? The body knows it's the body knows itself. So we know who Christ is. That's why anything that would seek to undermine the integrity of and the authority of the church. It's not about just like, oh, you won't do what we say. It's like, no, 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 you want to, we know who he is. So when we say, no, this is Christ, that authority is given to us because we're his body. And there is no confusion there. Getting back to what I was talking about with the creed, are you following me? So like, yes, we look at this and we go, look, man, okay. These people who maybe not, who are not in the body, right? Like you're not baptized, you're not integrated in the body, but like we will reserve judgment. Because if I look at you and like, well, you know, Christ is doing something, I don't know. But you know what? I'm not going to say. I just know where the Holy Spirit is. I know where I know where I am becoming. I know where people are made human. And it's in the church. I also know that if someone follows these processes to a certain degree, they will find healing. Like, this is the 12 steps, right? The 12 steps work only because they already take processes of integration that are already found in the church. Like they didn't come up with anything different. They just articulated something that was already in the church for the means of man to be integrated. Are you following me? But that only takes you so far. But that's why we, that's why we say like, hey, you know, God bless. We leave that to Christ. He's gonna bring the judgment, but we know here that we are being made whole, we're being made human. And then when we begin that process of being made human, we can now have grace poured in us, right? And that's what it means to be man, is to be a vessel in which can receive divine grace. This that's is a big invitation. royal, this is a big royal path moment uh, for me, Father, like a realization here about just seeing the just seeing the left and because. It's also this, also this week, I've had a few conversations, you know, uh, one in particular Catholic friend of mine. And it was interesting, like the way that he was talking about sort of what he felt his responsibility to the church was, was very interesting to me in the way that I was, because I was just like, I don't, it was a very, it was a very right side thing. And it was in response to this left side. And it was about this disintegration of this integration aspect, right? So it's like, what I see with the, the, the woke side, and especially what you're talking about in terms of what's going on with, with the youth, like what the woke is doing to the youth in this, dis, in this integration, disintegration context is, you know, saying, look, you are disintegrated like saying you're disintegrated. And we know somewhere deep down because we're fallen, we know that's true. Like that they start with that statement because the church is good. The church is acknowledging that as well. Like, yes, you are disintegrated because of the, because of the fall, but like, here's the process to get integrated. But what the woke say instead is no, everybody's disintegrated. 
everybody feels bad about de being disintegrated. And the problem is not that they're disintegrated. The problem is that they feel bad about it. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do, since everybody's disintegrated, we need to make everybody feel comfortable with their disintegration. Right. We need to do everything possible right. to let them manifest and express their disintegration in whichever way they want. And then we need to accept this disintegrated icon that they are presenting to us so that they don't feel bad and that that's the right thing to do, right? Like totally on the left. Constant then, like, affirmation that that's perfectly fine to be that way. That is perfect. That is perfectly fine to be disintegrated. And it's like on the right hand side and sort of what, what I was hearing is this, like from in these conversations that I was having is on the right hand side, there's this idea that like, no, that is so bad. Like that is so bad. Okay. Yes, that's bad. But the answer to that is here is this like rigidness, but we are going to be correct and rigid for the sake of rigidness and correct mm -hmm. correctness, mm -hmm. not for life. To, and, and it's like to prevent that from manifesting mm -hmm. inside the church. And it's like, mm. Mm -hmm. like right. if right. the church is Christ, right. which I, which to me, that's like, fully deep down in my bones i'm like yes this this is christ mm -hmm. like he doesn't he's got it you know what i mean mm -hmm. he does it's what what am i gonna do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what am i what am i gonna do you know what i mean so it's like th th but the rigidness and no healing no idea that like no it would be better if there was a place that these people could get it it's because there's no place that people feel like they can become integrated that this is continuing mm -hmm. you know what i mean like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so right. that right hand side and then it's like down the middle you say you know you saying no it's about a process the, the point of the process is integration and healing mm -hmm. it's right. everything so i think just real quick because I'm, I'm as you're saying this i'm like how can we understand this because i could understand how some people's thought process now in regards of like the body and like what do you do about inclusion all the stuff and like i would just offer to someone in regards of like my rebuttal to the right and that rigidness is we have to be careful to realize that we are still in that process of integration. You, you see what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. so I almost look at it as like growth, right? So it's like, it's the athlete who says, I don't need to get leaner. I don't need to get more muscle. I don't need to, you know what I mean? Like, what? Like, what do you mean, you know? any athlete right like any artist any musician any any like that's part also of what it means to be human is to ascend and to grow like knock knock ding dong i got a, i got a message for everybody that's what we're going to be spending eternity doing is growing and ascending more and more deeper into who god is and therefore us becoming more and more like him, right? So the problem with this rigidness, especially, is that it, it the devil loves it. He's like, great, because rigidness turns into self-righteousness. Self-righteousness turns into this, self-righteousness produces now moralism and codification of moral and, and moralism is so problematic because on so many levels moralism calcifies right moralism removes the dynamic and this gets into this whole thing in regards of Nietzsche and Dionysius and Apollo right and the idea that Apollo is static and it's just like no you know and and you know there's that demonic inference in there that he's trying to get at you know Dionysus being Satan obviously Apollo being God right but it's God is not static right and Jesus Christ the same today yesterday forever like yes absolutely God is unchanging God is unchanging but not static in the sense of the accusation that's given do you see what I'm saying because we will explore God forever God is like life and life is <laughs> I was just thinking about this today. The thing about the, the, the thing about the life in Christ, the thing about like the life, the spiritual life is that it is this it is this perfect it, it, it's, it's, it's compromised with these perfect moments in which you see that 
life isn't quite like a manicured garden in the sense that it's this perfect rigid like you know what i mean it, it there's there's the sparks of life to it. You see it with children. You see what I'm saying? And so anything that would have you be rigid, that would have you hinder life, this is, this is the reason why the church's approach to certain things in regards of like sexuality and stuff, so much of it has to do with the preservation of life. And what I mean by that is I don't just mean like we want to keep people alive, but we want to preserve our understanding of what life is right and so there is this kind of like dynamic i dare say almost wildness to life that if that's not there and it becomes something sterile it, it, it's dying are you following what i'm saying so yes, yes. It, so it's it's super key and that's where people begin to distort and pervert quote-unquote tradition right because uh, a great example is like iconography, speaking about the coming man, right? Iconography is primarily about incarnation, right? But the thing is, is like people have at times had a very wrong and still do a very wrong approach to iconography in the sense of it. They think that holding the tradition means slavishly copying it. And, and like, once you've done that, it's no longer an icon because it's that living aspect of it is gone. Yes. You are just re reproducing a museum piece. There's yes. no life in it. And no one can pray in front of an icon like that, truly. Do you see what I'm yes. saying? Yes. So, yes. so this aspect, like the tradition of the church, right? Tradition fundamentally is life-giving, right? Mm -hmm. And so anything that tries to calcify a facet of quote unquote tradition out of fear and a rigidness, it ceases to actually be a part of that tradition. It becomes some sort of weird distortion. Do you see what I'm saying? Because the revelation, it, revelation is like a proof of life. Revelation right? that, is, that yeah. revelation continues is the proof of the life. Well, the experience, the right? Experience the experience of, of revelation. Okay, yes. yes. Okay. Right? Okay. okay. The experience, and I, I just want to say that because also too, it's like, we're not, this is one of the key things for us, you know, again, stay on the royal path. We are looking for new revelation. We are, we are looking to purify ourselves to receive more and more of the revelation that's given. And that's, that's really key and important to understand because with the coming of the new monsters that are, that are here, that are coming more and more, whatever revelation, whatever false revelation, UFOs, aliens, the new transhumanism, all of this is false in regards of like, no, there's, it's presented as new revelation, right? And that's where we're at, right? The age of miracle, which we are entering into, this is also, there's an undercurrent of like false revelation. We aren't looking for revelation, new revelation. We are looking to purify ourselves so that we can see the revelation that was given more clearly. We're not looking for anything new. We're not going to be like, oh, the fathers didn't understand that. No. <laughs> People start saying that. Don't listen to them. People start talking about, well, the fathers, this and this and that. Don't listen to them, right? Because that's a slope down this, like, looking for new revelation, right? And that's this whole thing. These people who are like, oh, origin and all this stuff. Origin was just maligned like all these things you have to watch out for these people because underneath of it is this beguiling spirit that there's something new that we need to no 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 there's nothing new the problem is us the problem is us and our lack of purity our lack of repentance when we repent right are we become integrated right the the cleaning process the purification process it removed look man I I have super glued so much stuff in my life. I'm gonna tell you something. What you gotta do? One of the first things you gotta do is when you got something broken and you gotta super glue it. What's one of the first things you gotta do? You gotta clean the pieces off. They always tell you make sure the pieces are clean because when you go to bond that thing back together, if it's not clean, that bond isn't gonna hold. You following me? So you got to, that purification process is the is the cleaning off of the pieces of the broken shards right the broken shards of your 
quote unquote identity, your ethnos, your gender, your, your age, your disposition, right? All of these things are pieces that are fragmented. So God puts them all together in the life of the church. He's the only way you can integrate being part Swedish and part French and being a woman and your dad being an alcoholic and you being into punk rock and you got, you know what I'm saying? He's the only way you can integrate being, you know, half Mexican, half black, like only God can do that and integrate it in a way that it'll hold water, that you will hold water, right? That's why, forgive me, I just gonna say real quick, I mean, people can look at me and they're like, and I, I, it's, it's just like, I don't, how, how do you work? How are you, this black guy who's tattooed and like all this weird stuff you're into, but like, it makes sense. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's, it's because Christ is integrating me, right? And those pieces that haven't been cleaned off, right? They're not integrated yet. And then if they can't be, guess what? Like the, Christ is, is, is forming me in a way in which I'm able to hold water, right? That's why there's a self-consciousness that you begin... So going back to early analogy, like you begin to, once you, and I'm not saying I'm a senior, that's what I'm saying, but once you get out of that junior stage, right, and you start getting into the senior stage, right, you're, you're a lot less self-conscious in certain ways, because now you're like, this is where I'm at, I'm getting ready to graduate, which is death, I better be about my business, right? Like in that freshman, sophomore stage, you're just like, who am I? I want to mimic. I want the affect. I want to do all this and that. But it's like, you're a junior, like, okay, like, this is, this is where I'm at, whatever. But by the time you're a senior, you're like, well, you know, it's going to be what it is, what it is, right? What can I do now with what I got? And, and, and whatever else needs to be done, well, it's got to be in God's hands. He's going to get the fine details. He's going to one that's going to be putting the etchings on the pottery. But if it's going to hold water, it's going to hold water. And like, you know, God help me. You, you understand what I'm saying? And then you go about your life and it's like, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to have to live my life the best that I can in a way of honoring God. And, you know, the judgment awaits me. Yeah, the lack of desire for affect. This is, I mean, just in, in what's that? Earned affect. Because like anybody Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but at that point it's not even affect, right? Like Father's yeah, saying, exactly. it's just it's just you. Yeah. You know, that, that you're not there's not there's nothing being put on. It's just yeah. like you wake up in the morning and you don't think about what it is that you're going to wear. You just wear what you wear because that's what you wear. It's uh -huh. like, <laughs> uh -huh. that is, that just is who you are. Uh -huh. And I think that, that there is, there is such a, it's interesting because that is such traditionally that has always been such the mark of wisdom. You know, everything that I've ever read, any philosopher, anything spiritual, that it's always been wisdom, like you say, that senior stage when someone is like, this person is wise, this person is a master. Well, even, I mean, I've been lucky enough in many different veins to have been around masters of different things. And that's the one thing that I could say about when you know that you're around a master is they're just doing the thing and there's no, there's no affect to it. It's very their 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 movements there's nothing extra mentally physically spiritually anything there's just nothing extra it's very efficient everything the way that it's moving through and there's no desire to impress anybody even though everything they're doing is incredibly impressive you know everything that's happening you're mm -hmm. you're madly impressed by and it it seems to me that the the value the cultural value that's put on affect like that there is this value to affect that the more affect you can put on something that that seems to be i'm thinking specifically like social media and the idea of like influencers that the that the idea you, you see somebody who's an influencer and it's like all affect right it's the, their their being their personality their brand if you will is 100 affect and you're like what is underneath is there anything underneath this is there anything there? But, but you know, this, this is making me see that it's like, they're stuck. Like to do that is to, 
is to prevent yourself from integration. It's to pre prevent yourself from wisdom. Well, it's like a feedback loop, isn't it, right? Because if you're doing affect for affect, then you're just going around in a circle all the time. There's, you're not doing it to be integrated. You're just this one little cell that's going around in a circle rather than- And, and you, have to keep you have to keep doubling and tripling and quadrupling down. Which is like a thing, yes, yeah, no, I see. See, this is, this is a thing too. Sorry, Andrew. Um, like, I want to point to something very specific. Um, I want to, I want to point to one of the um, expressions, one of the practices of the Church of Oak, hmm. right? Um, and it, and it's virtue signaling. And I want to point to that right now because virtue signaling is actually a result or a manifestation that's, that had been cooking, which is exhibitionism, you know, Instagram, all that stuff influencing, right? That virtue signaling is the logical conclusion of it. Virtue signaling is the religious expression of that phenomena of exhibitionism. Right. Are you following me at all with all this? Right. Well, because virtue, the idea of virtue is a religious idea. Right. And so virtue signaling is this mockery. It's a perversion. It's a it's a antichrist aspect of it. It's like, it's like church woke is an antichrist thing. Right. In the place of. Right. Because it takes the idea of virtue, which is which is a religious idea, and it perverts it by coupling it with exhibitionism. But virtue, in order for it to be inherently virtuous, must be authentic. In order for it to be authentic, it must be private. It must be yes. internal. It must yeah. be devoid of hypocrisy. You hey. see what I'm saying? St. Ignatio Branchinov says, our good deeds not only must be hidden from people, but from our own selves, so that the praise may not wither our soul that our heart itself may not praise us becoming an adulterer of vanity instead of faithful spouse of humility. That was Andrew, not the can, quote. Can, Andrew, can you read that again, just a little slower for everybody? Because that's gold, what you just said, right? Yeah, now. it's yeah. Um, slow, read it. Uh, that was also not the quote I was looking for, but it's a good one. So our good deeds not only must be hidden from people, but from our own selves. So that their praise not may not wither our soul, and that our heart itself may not praise us, becoming an adulterer with vanity instead of a space a faithful spouse of humility. There's another one, uh, which was the one I was actually looking for, where he was talking about um, when pride is coupled with your good deeds, it actually becomes for your detriment rather than your benefit. So you could do all the good things, all the good things, genuinely good things in the world that you want, but if it's out of pride then it's actually becoming much more harmful to your soul and to the world as a whole. I was looking for that one, but I got that one. Well, there's your Gates Foundation, Zuckerberg, right. Chan, right. all of, I mean, that's right. it right there. Right. And, it's, and it's, it's, it's inherently repugnant to people. And that's a big response. That's why the virtue signaling, and if it's the, the rebuttal and the response to virtue signaling was actually, from my perspective, a, an authentic one. It wasn't part of that Hegelian dialectic. I don't think it, it wasn't a produced counter. It wasn't a produced antithesis, right? To produce strife. It was an actual legitimate response because it's repugnant. Like virtue signaling is repugnant. It, it's like, you, you see what I'm saying? And this is inherently opposed to authentic spiritual integration did you, you see what i'm saying hypocrisy father, father if there was yeah. no virtue if virtue signaling wasn't a thing that had been integrated by the church of woke and fully enabled by social media there would be no kids poked right now right all of the all of the woke right. pokes delivered right. to children right. is all because the parents get a chance to virtue signal right after they've done it that's that's dude that's why they're doing it Right. It's the same hey, and genderism as well, because oh my gosh, out, Andrew, oh, God bless you. but love and faith, nothing but love and faith. Yeah, but. yeah, because that's literally what I was about to go to because I, I 
I saw this thing where this guy was reviewing some HBO or Showtime series on like these following these transgender kids. You know what I mean? And it was shocking. It was scandalous. It was absolutely heartbreaking to see how these poor kids' moms, and just think of the moms, forgive me, but I'm going to go there. There was no dad in any of these cases of these transgender kids. Like, if there was a dad, he was tail between his legs in the corner, just like whatever, checked out or, you know, just whatever, no longer a man. It was all these, you know, devouring mother. It was every single one of them, devouring mother and just kind of like holding up her kid as like, she's, she's present, this is her kind of like the zenith of her virtue signaling. You see what I'm saying? And using her kid as this pariah to like- As an offering. As an, as she's an making, offering. She's, it's, uh, child, it's child sacrifice is really what sacrifice. it is because she's because they're destroying the children's lives. Yep, it's child sacrifice. It's child sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's- I, yep. and all, it's of, funny. all of this is child sacrifice. That's it's the funny. crazy part about it. It's funny because I start thinking about some people who just like, you know, are Christians, you know, maybe even orthodox god help them and it's just like they're not offering their child as sacrifice in the same explicit manner but it's 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 it, it's it's almost like the, the payment of extortion it's like leave me alone or like hey i'm not as bad i'm not like one of them i'm kind of with you see i'm gonna allow my kid to like participate in this do you, do you understand what i'm saying yes. Yeah. Like it's, it's still almost this weird super, it's, it's still this weird pagan offering. It's, it, it's not it's the a same pinch of incense. The, it's a pinch of incense. It's a pinch of incense, man. It's the pinch of incense. And it's just like, it's so heartbreaking to me because it's like, that's your job. Like the one, like, I mean, this gets us back all the way to episode one about being like a father or episode two, whatever. And just like, you know, I stand by this. A father has to be ready to be hated by his kids. Like, like if you can't do that, you don't deserve to be called a father. Write me, send me hate mails. I don't care. If you're not prepared to be hated by your kids, you don't deserve to be a father. Straight up. You know what I mean? Because what that means and what I'm saying is you love your kids enough to be like, no, I love you too much. It's like, no, this is, this will destroy you. Right. And if you destroy yourself, it's going to be over my dead body. It's going to be, I'm not blessing it. I'm I can't bless your destruction. You see what I'm saying? Like, and then they will hate you by the way. And then they, they will, hate you. They, they will hate you for that. They will hate you, but you must be the rock and not sand. And you must stand by the principle and author of life, not just for your salvation, but for theirs. And then if God wills, their free will will eventually be turned to the good. Their hearts will be softened, but it can only And, and their love for you will come around at that exactly. same time when that happens. Exactly. Then they'll but, understand what you did. Exactly. But you have to be immovable. You have, you have to be rock. And this is, man, <laughs> this is what it means to be human also. You learn to become hard so that the, you learn to become like stone so that your heart can become soft. If you understand what I'm saying. You know what I mean? Like anger is the fathers, are, fathers are clear on this. The fathers, the neptic fathers who teach on the, the, the issues of the heart, they will talk about anger, right? And if you're not careful, you can get confused on this, but anger is given to us by God precisely to fight against evil. That's why God, that's why God has given it to us. And it's primarily one of the things that God has given man as a disposition, right? Because we need to use anger in its proper sense. That's why St. Paul says, be angry and do not sin. We need to use these proper dispositions to push against evil, right? And we must become 
indomitable. We have to set our face like a flint, as the scriptures say, in, in the face of these things, right? That's what it means to be, be human, right? Like we are, we are the image, we are the symbol of the meeting of heaven and earth. That's what we are, right? And so the spirit, the angelic aspect of us, the inner life, the soul, right? This must be fluid, this must be soft, this must be all of these things that are given to us with the experience and the analogy of, of wind and of water, right? But we have to, the, the, the material part of us has to be grounded in the sense of like, not everything can be fluid. We have to say like, no, the parameters that God has given, this is, do not remove the ancient landmarks that your forefathers have set, as it says in the scripture. We have to recognize these things and be like, no, these things are put into place for a reason. You know what I mean? They're put into place for a reason. And when we honor God in, in obedience and repentance, he gives us the strength to be that rock and to say no, right? And that's the proper integration of soul and body. That's the proper integration of, you know, the immaterial, and the material aspect. This is what it means to be human, right? And our children and, the, and the, the protecting of our children, even if they're not your biological children, if they're your God children, if they're children in the parish, like that's part of how we grow in the ability to discern what it means to be human. Because free will is a necessary aspect of reality. And that necessary aspect of reality has to be engaged properly, right? It can't be snuffed out through being rigid, right? But it also can't be let wild. It can't be let rampant. It has to, it, the royal path has us govern freedom, free will in the proper sense. And, and that's what, that's our work as adults, quote unquote, but as maturing human beings to help the young ones mature. We have to show them this is what it means to be human. You, you follow what I'm saying? Same this is a, this yeah. is like, this is super yeah, this is super deep. And especially if we're talking about, you know, because I keep, I, I'm, you're saying these things and I'm laying them out against the vein of transhumanism, which, which is a, such a danger. Like it is, it is a gigantic, and maybe I see it more because I'm in the tech world. And so I have some background of like the, the small insidious threads that have been woven to get us to where we are. And also probably it's some things that I'm repenting for myself as being in that world and thinking, Oh no, this is good. Like let's go forward with this technology or this technology or this technology, you know, in the past, um, which is a big, big difference for me now, but this, this, I, I just see this plan of confusing and putting walls up around what is it to be human? And then sort of getting to like what you said, Andrew, of trying to introduce this idea that there is, that there's some confusion about what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. Like this has not been figured out, mm -hmm. which when you stop and you think about it for a while, it's like, how, how would it be possible for tens, hundreds of thousands of years for people to be walking around interacting and not figured out what it means to be human? How are we even here? That doesn't make any sense. Like, is there any other animal that hasn't, like, would we say that, <laughs> would I say that this kingfisher hasn't figured out what it is right. to be a kingfisher, that a fish hasn't figured out what it is to be a fish? It's ridiculous. Right. It's a ridiculous idea, but I, I, I totally see how that is, if there is a spirit that hates mankind, mm -hmm. that is exactly, all like that's the beginning the beginning is confuse it as to what it is mm -hmm. and everything else will fall in line with its destruction mm -hmm. because yeah. how because how else can you sustain yourself sustain yourself as an animal except for the fact that you are somewhere deep-seated aware of what you are and not questioning what you are right i mean that's instinct right exactly and and, and so and this is part of the problem is that even this whole thing of conflating and, and equating the animal aspect of us with what we are in totality, 
You, you see what I'm saying? So it's almost one aspect you almost say is like, well, you know, we are the marrying, like we are this symbol of, of creation, right? Um, you know, heaven and earth, right? The, 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 the visible and the invisible, a angel and animal. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like angel and animal, like that's kind of what we are too. We're just marrying these things. And like this instinct aspect of it, instinct is what defines the totality of, of, what it, of, of what it means to be animal. And whatever particular animal that is, there's a particular instinctual aspect which defines its essence. Are you following me? Like the, the, you could say almost yes. like in a maximus yes. sense, the logo of it, okay. But for us, that's just an, a facet of it. It's not the whole thing. And so when we start saying people like, well, I'd rather take, uh, I'd rather save a dog any day over humans, right? This whole misanthropic thing that's been, you know, dropped into the water, which is so repugnant to me. I remember, uh, forgive me, I'm sorry. If, if, <laughs> I was the one to go there. Well, I'll just say, I was in a wedding. No, I was in a wedding. I was in a, I was, an observer in a wedding in which uh, the dogs of the bride and the groom were chosen over their own nephews to be, <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? Like that whole thing. Like the ring, the ring bearer and the yeah, flower yeah, yeah, girl yeah, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. This, this whole thing. And like, look, I got a dog. I got a pit bull named Bane. I love Bane. You know what I mean? I got snakes. I love my snakes, whatever. But you know what? I am nowhere close. I mean, I would rather have hot pokers jabbed in my ears than try to equate my children, my, my biological children with, with the animals. You, you see what I'm saying? On, on, on any real level, right? But people oh, but do that's that the now. thing now, Father. People dog, do it now. Dog mom yes. and cat mom. Yes. That'll be like an identity for yes. them. Yes, people do it now. People do it now. And I'm not talking to you if you have your cat and you love your cat. You know that's what I'm not. That's not what I'm talking about. But if you're a Christian, right, and you legitimately have that thought of like, well, I would save my cat over human. Like something's wrong with you. You know what I'm saying? Because instinct is the defining characteristic of, of the essence of animal right? And we are not animal. We're human, right? We transcend instinct, right? I, let me, show, man, let me show you another way that the enemy is eroding everything. We all know this, but let's put it in this context. The loss of marriage, the loss of marriage, right? Let's, we'll go down this road, man. Like, Marriage is a symbol of Christ and his church, right? But marriage is also a symbol of what it means primarily to be human, right? Because as an instinct, right? As an instinct, Andrew wants to have a harem. Like that's what he wants, right? On a real base level. As an instinct. As, as an, an instinct. instinct mm -hmm. Every man, every Andrew wants to have a harem. Sorry, that's just a fact. You know what I mean? But what happens is when you now become initiated and you get and you are now growing in the life of Christ, you say, I have this instinct, but I'm going to say no to it, right? I'm going to have one wife and I'm going to honor her. But you know what happens? I'm going to tell you something that happens. Not only do you like recognize that that instinct is wrong, and you choose not to do it because that's love, by the way. Love is not your emotion and your attraction to your wife. Love is the choice to be faithful and not an animal. That's what love is, by the way. But more importantly, you actually come to this place where you don't even desire the harem anymore. Do you see what I'm saying? You, you actually 100%. transcend that desire, right? It's mm -hmm. like, even if I could have it, I don't want it because... This devotion to this woman and the, the, this, the marrying of our souls and our flesh is so much greater than the, than the harem, even if I could have it, quote unquote, legally. Are you following what I'm saying? That's if anybody's me, following what you're human. saying, Father, I'm following. I mean, you. look, <laughs> I mean, listen, let me sit back and you tell me. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, that's 
<laughs> you know what it I mean? Was, it, it was marriage that did that. It was, it was well, it, I think it was marriage to an Orthodox woman that did that, I'm going to say. That's yeah. what I'm going to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I wouldn't have, ch- I wouldn't have, I had no yeah. desire to, to marry another, another woman. Let's just put it like that yeah. out, of, out of the women I had encountered. Yeah. So, but, but that, like when you were saying that, I was just like, it was yeah. ticking off all the boxes to where I just, it's weird. And I like, I look back myself and I'm like, okay, this, this, this was a thing. This was a time in my life, but I also, you know, you know, I was, I was also very like publicly and philosophically, you know, arguing, I guess, for that exact position that like, this is your instinct. So this is, this is what you should do. And this will fulfill you. And the interesting thing about it is like, I look back and there's, there's some of the things there, you know, some of the things that I said about monogamy and marriage, like, in in let's say earlier work that I did things in my first book somebody had asked me like oh do you want to take some of these things back from out of like the first book that you wrote and it's interesting because like I go back and I look in there and it's like nothing is wrong like there's something where I say that like um marriage is uh marriage is like a form of uh of slavery I say like it's like you're choosing to be a slave and what's interesting is that it's like it's not all, it's not, it's not wrong because it's like, yes, you, yes, you are choosing that, but the other side, which is what was left out, it's just, it's not wrong. It's just incomplete. This mm-hmm. like the other slot, the other side is slavery too. Mm-hmm. It's slavery right. to your passions. Right. <laughs> you know? So right. it's like, would you rather be a slave to your wife who loves you? Mm-hmm. And in that way to also serve and, and to serve god and to serve christ or would you rather be a slave to your passions Mm -hmm. and in that way serve the adversary because you the the the, what was missing was it's slavery but you can't decide not to be a slave right you can only decide who is who you will serve that's it you know and so it's like yes it is definitely slavery but it is so preferable to being a slave to your passions right Right. So preferable. So preferable. I mean, because being a slave to your passions is death. Exactly. 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 And it's not, it, it's, it's also funny because there's no, there's just nothing people think, I think people think that they may, might want that kind of a life. And I know that I could never talk some young guy who's like, Oh no, maybe they would look back at my life and be like, Pfft what are you talking about? Like that you wouldn't want that life. And you know what? I said the same thing when I read Iceberg Slim's book, Pimp for the first mm-hmm. time. And in it, he's like, you don't want this life. And at the end, he's even going through his time in solitary confinement in prison and all the things. And he's like, this is a cautionary tale. No, 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 no. I didn't see that. Right. When, when, I, when I was a young man and I read that book for the first time, all I saw was like, oh, he just did it wrong. Right. You know, if I was doing this, I would have done it so much better. Like, look at everything that he had. Oh, that's where he screwed it up. And it's like, even knowing that, going into it, it's like, I did all the same mistakes. All the same things. Because it's like, yep, you were just a slave. Right. You were just a slave to your passions. Right. You know, there was no chance that you were going to do it right. Right. You could go back now and look at it just like reading Iceberg Slim's book and be like, oh, right there, right there. If you just would have made this decision. And it's like, no, he got the name Iceberg because he got a a bullet went through his hat, the top of his hat. And he didn't move because he was because of uh, he was he was so uh, blown on coke. Wow. So he didn't even move. And the guy was like, man, you are that is icy. Your Iceberg is your new name. You know (laughs) what I mean? And it's like he couldn't have made good decisions. Right. Just the same way as me when I'm waking up and at 11 o'clock, I start drinking, you know, as soon as the gym is done, I'm drinking. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, and there's all these things. Are, so that's, that's what I, that's what I think is so interesting is that you're absolutely right. Like it's, mm-hmm. but you can't, I don't, you, you can't tell somebody. No, it's almost like, you know, you can't give the cautionary tale 
it just has to be and somebody who wants who's really driven down that path and who sees no alternative the church wasn't there for me as far as i know. i mean it was there but as far as i knew it didn't exist you know well, see, and it's like go it, ahead father it, it, go ahead i'm i'm rambling now because no, you no, got no, me no, on no. something you know what i mean here's the thing one thing that's missing is that like another key portion of being human and this is looking at if we want to know what's human if we want to know what it means to be human you have to look to christ like 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 you were saying like we don't we don't need to stumble in the darkness like like however many like we have a, like we have the blueprint we look at christ right so here's the thing humility right and and that's that's what's so that's what's not missing that's what's been destroyed in the in the image and the potential of, of being human nowadays and this gets us back to the tower of babel the 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 the, the, the neo the neo babel because now that you can see everything the fact that you can see it you think that you have mastery over it you think that you get it you think that you understand it there's no space for discovery and there's no space for that ignorance that must be like there's no space for the ignorance of humility if you understand what i'm saying so what happens is is now if i can read it if i can see it i watch it i understand it i know it and now you start willfully quote unquote entering into these things which there's still a measure of ignorance in regards of like you really don't know what you're doing you think you do but you don't right but like when the when the Lord says, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do, it's like man was in this age, right? Because there's the it's that golden access, right? Christ coming at that that gold that 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 uh, axial age, you know what I mean? And like the the awakening of man, that's one of the few things. Well, I will borrow from these kind of like comparative thoughts. It's like the axial age is this kind of like awakening of man. You can see it happening. Uh, across the globe and all these various philosophical and religious movements and Christ being, you know, in, in, in a cosmological sense, the zenith of it, in which now everything is able to find formation and start ascending, if you understand what I'm saying there, right? But from that point now, ignorance takes on a whole different thing. There's a more willful aspect of it, progressively progressively to the point where we're now at this point where it's like some aspect of the gospel has gone out not the full gospel not the orthodox gospel not the gospel of endurance to the end not the gospel of humility not the gospel of of, 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 re of true restoration salvation but some aspects gone out people people are hearing but more importantly people are accessing the pandora's box in a way that they never did before and that accessing of the pandora's box is so dangerous and it's the thing that actually is sending people to hell because now they're able to go through your experience cyprian and all of our experience in ways never before where we can read about an iceberg slim we can read about a grimes we can read about a donald trump we can read and we can want to emulate that life and say like i see where you went wrong and i'm gonna da 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 that's dangerous because for me, I could be wrong. In fact, let's just assume I'm wrong. God will show up at the end of time. But I think one of the reasons why I'm at where I'm at right now, if it's all God's mercy, I'm not saying anything other than that, but I, I, there is a synergy that we have to acknowledge. You know what I mean? I, looking back, I had a, I had a window of time at the end of my years of, being, you know, practicing and being in the world. I had this period of time where I honestly and authentically just wanted to know the truth. Like I had, a, I had a small space of window where I didn't, it wasn't like, I'll take anything but you, Jesus. Like I, you know what I mean? I had my God forgive me. I'm repenting of that. I had those moments where I would mock Christians in, in philosophy class. I had that moment, like a lot of people do, but there was a space and time where I was like, so humbled in my life where I was like, I don't care. I don't care if it's the grays. I don't care if it's Kali. 
I don't care if it's Jesus. I just want to know what's the truth. Because if I don't know, I'm going to die. I just, I, I, you know what I mean? And I believe it's that small crack in my pride that God was able to start putting some light. And by his mercy, I was able to respond. You see what I'm saying? But that, that was also really kind of like pre-internet. That was also a time when like, you know, like I had these texts that are, I was reading that I had to find. I, I, and they came to me, like they came to me probably for nefarious means, but God used those nefarious intentions for my, for what's, what God will, God will, will be my salvation. But like, it's very different now when someone can go on the internet and just read everything, they can assume like, oh yeah, here's the steps. I got this. I know this. Like young men and women already have a hard enough time with hubris and thinking they know everything. It's already hard enough. But now you have things where it's just like, no, nah, you don't get it. Like I can talk to a kid now and I can be like, well, when I blah, 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 and I was a kid, this and that, and they can go back and they can maybe even some kid, one of my kids, God forbid, right? One of my kids, let's just say, he can go back and he can go like, tick, 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 and look up all these past episodes of let's say the Royal Path and be like, oh, yeah, I get him. I know what he's all about. Cause see, he said, you, you see what I'm saying? They can take a snippet of what I've said, like, oh, I know him. I know what he's about. And they and now they have constructed this thing which gives them mastery over me. It's like, you'll get this and forgive me for, for going there. But it's like they think they know my true name, right? Because knowing the name, you have the power over the thing, right? So they think they know my true name. It's like, well, I know your name, blah, 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 right? Well, but people this, expect this, Father. Well, people, you tell somebody something or somebody's, in, mm-hmm. you know, I see this all the time where people are like, well, what's a video I could watch, book I could read, right. you know, but it's, right. and it's like, there's an expectation that incoming is going to be, you know, all of this. And it's, you're right, that it's like the desire, there's no space for, there's no space for revelation. Mm-hmm. And, and right. for me, especially when it comes to spirituality and, and this is just. You Cause know, real quick, that's demonic. Go ahead. Still in there. Yes. Real yes, quick, that's exactly. demonic because the demons know everything. That. That's it's demonic. That. The demons know everything, but what it means to be human is to have space for revelation. What it means to be human yes. is to grow. Listen, man. Oh, Lord Jesus, praise you. Listen, please go. <laughs> not even, no one knows the time. Only the Father. Not even the angels in heaven. You, you see what I'm saying? That, that moment in Jesus saying, only the Father knows that time. People scratch their heads about this. About Jesus not knowing when the time is. You know what I'm talking about in the scriptures? This is Jesus showing us what it means to be human. Mm-hmm. Leaving space for that revelation. This is what it means to become man, to be man. That space in which you engage the father of light who knows all things. When you come to him as only you can, when you know that you don't know everything, that's the only way you can say Abba. And it's like, I don't know, only you know. But the demons will never do that because they know everything. And that's why an unclean spirit. That's why the arrogance, it's so repugnant. And that's why pride, God can't be in the presence of it. And that's why pride separates an individual from God. And that's why we, when we become like little children, we become human, right? When we are able to say, this is what, this is the mystery of like, why he says, let the children come unto me because a true child says, daddy, Abba, I don't know. Feed me, care for me, teach me, show me. Right. And they love to be in the mystery. Like I see that with my children. They love, they, they, they relish being, they relish being with me in their childlike, we, we would say ignorance, but innocence. Innocence. 
Innocence. You know, they they love Innocence. they love to yes. to to know that it's like yes. it's actually okay that yes. I don't know the answer to this. Yes. And it's and the answer that comes they 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 don't want when when my 2-year-old asks me why she doesn't want me to give her a bibliography. No. She doesn't want me to send her to a YouTube video. She wants to interact with me as her father, yes. that I know something she doesn't know. Yes. And just whatever comes back from me is valuable to her. Yes, yes. Every single thing. It's the glory of God to hide the thing. It's the glory of man to discover it, right? That's, that's what the scriptures teach us, right? Well, nobody knows, well, myself included, nobody knows how to learn. I mean, because exactly. like, they, they just want the information and like, I liken it to something from my own personal experience that it's like, it's very easy for me to just like learn about archery and about to just sit there and, but like, it's through the process of messing up and getting frustrated and getting angry and starting to like really having to break down my ego to get to a point of being like, maybe I really just don't know how to do this thing. And then that's when stuff actually starts to come. And then that's when like, I actually feel like there's an actual experiential knowledge rather than information that I'm like picking up there. And like, that's when you can talk to someone who on like a theoretical level interacts with God, as opposed to like, mm -hmm. as opposed to somebody who's saying like, well, it is and it isn't. Because I mean, there have been times where God's been good to me and there's been times where God has needed to like chasten me. And it's just like, well, yeah. I mean, because you did something bad. Well, no, not necessarily. Right. Like I didn't necessarily do something bad. Like I, I, I needed maybe encouragement in this one way that chastening was going to encourage me in this way. Like, oh, I did something good and something bad happened to me it means I got to do that. Keep doing that good thing. And then there times where it's like oh i did something bad i got chased and i gotta stop doing that bad thing and it's like to someone who's you know biblically minded you know like in the sense of they've read so, the uh, like sola scriptura just biblically minded yeah. there you go it confounds them it confounds them to like be able to like actually speak to them in that way it's like what father Tripo said where someone said to him it's like, you know, God, instead of like, you've heard about God, you know, well, with, with, with archery, I mean, you being able to, you know, you, you watch like Olympic level archery where they're, they're fighting over, you know, millimeters because they're just hitting the bullseye every single time mm -hmm. and they're fighting over millimeters. And then you're like, articulate that articulate what you're doing. Yeah. It's a feeling you and you can't all read you can, your way to that. You could read all the archery books in the world, <laughs> watch really all the archery videos in the world from a perspective of what is it not? And it's right. not, it's not standing like that. It's not moving like that. It's not thinking this, it's not doing that. You can't do that. The thing is so big. I can't describe what it is to you. All I can tell you is what it's not. And then that discovery, it's magical. When you get that moment, when you feel your anchor at the right spot, when you feel your breath, when you feel everything, it's like time stops for a second. And you just like, literally, it's like, I don't know. Yeah, you're experiencing the now, which is the only way to experience God. Yeah. Right. The knowledge of God can be found in the past and to some degree, even the future, if we're talking about eschatology, right? But the experience of God is only possible in the present, in the now, in the flow of it, right? That's 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 the real experience of God. Because God right. is outside of time, yeah. God is yeah. outside of time, and yeah. now and now is outside of time. Yeah, and and now is time in that sense is time in the sense in which we're describing time of past, future, right? These are not just I don't want to say like you know they're constructs of man, but they are things that are created in that sense right? But the experience of the now is outside of that. It's like, you, you see what I'm saying? Because it, it's participation in the life of God. Right? That's why it, liturgy it, is difficult sometimes, because you have to be so present in that now. Absolutely. And that's why there's a discipline to it, right? Which is only possible through the integration, hmm. right? Because one of the things is, when you're not integrated, your body may be somewhere, but your mind is elsewhere. 
right? Yeah. Or, your, or your mind may be somewhere, but your body is elsewhere because of anxiety. You see what I'm saying? Integration allows for the whole person to be present, which is why one of the fruits of integration is prayer. Because this is, this is, again, for those who aren't initiated, for those who are initiated, you understand the discipline of prayer. But the, uniniti the uninitiated, they think of prayer as like, well, what do you, you keep talking about prayer. What do you mean? Do you mean like asking God for something? Like, how do you ask God for something for an hour? How is that? It's like, no, no, no. You don't know what prayer is, right? Prayer is, prayer is, is the, 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 pra the prayer is the experience of being in the presence of God. That's what prayer is, right? And so in order to do that, you have to be present within your whole self. You have to be, you have to be integrated. That's the only way prayer is possible. And that's why we practice prayer, because the practicing of prayer is, is the means to grow in prayer, right? And that's being in the present. And that is something that is also what it means to be man. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? Man experiences that. The demons don't experience that. We do. Same, the, demons don't, the demons don't pray. No. Saint Matrona um, was a saint who was born without eyes. She's a Russian saint who was born without eyes, and uh, but she had spiritual vision. And there was a time when they were in liturgy, and they were leaving, and um, they were talking about being in liturgy. And Saint Matrona was like, her whole family was there, but uh, she was talking afterwards. She's like, oh, mom wasn't there, and she's like, what are you talking about, honey? Yes, I was. Of course, I was there. She's like, no, you weren't. You weren't in liturgy, like. And she saw truly that like her mom was not there right. because like her mom was thinking of other things. I mean, oh man, that's a sobering thought. It's like, right. oh, St. Matrona, where am I right now? And right. it's like, you're probably at Jimmy John's because you're kind of hungry <laughs> right now. And like, you're absolutely right, St. Matrona. And uh, the other thing I want to say earlier, you guys were on a really good flow, so I didn't interrupt, but to what Father was saying about being stony on the outside and soft on the inside is St. Porphyrios. He said that he eventually figured it out, I think, but his elders often appeared to be angry, but were not angry. Like mm -hmm. they would act angry, but they were not angry on the inside. Mm -hmm. And I found that is, I cannot, I don't get to do it very often. I don't have the grace very often, but I can't tell you how well my children respond to that. There's just something about emptying myself and acting angry that they respond to. Because I remember being a kid and seeing my kid, like my parents would get really upset. And I could just tell down to the core that they were upset. And I was just like, look at this joker. Like, you look like a fool right now. Like, your face is all red and you have your veins coming on the side. Any respect, any kind of, like, discipline I was going to take away from that was out the window. Like, you lost credentials in my eyes. Because it's just like, I could tell, like, you were actually, like, and not that that's. Lost control. Well, it's stern. Yeah. It's sternness, right? It's sternness, like it's anger as opposed to rage. So rage. it's like rage. It's, it's like if about. yeah, it's like if you're if you're or frustration, right? But it's like a drill sergeant, right? You know, yeah. you know that like that drill sergeant's not angry. That drill so anything you're gonna do, that drill sergeant has seen many, many, many times, and you're not gonna. He, this is just what he does, right? But. He's he's start, he's barking orders. He's yelling. He's stern. Uh, any uh, any good coach, but you see again, like this is masters. Masters yeah. have that because it's just this is what I mean. It's the same thing with my children. Like I'm never. I I will absolutely if my two daughters are going at each other and doing all of this. Oh, my voice will be raised. I'm not. I'm not upset. I'm not frustrated. They're two and six. Mm -hmm. A two-year-old and a six-year-old is not going to impact <laughs> my my being. You know what I mean? But if they're if they're going and they're going to hurt each other, yes, my voice will be raised, and I will take care of the situation. And then after that, though, it's very e like all the way. I can go all the way down very easily. But I I certainly have experienced. I certainly have experienced. You know people where I knew that there was a real rage that they were feeling for their children. And you could also see with the children that like what the children wanted to do was just be done with this person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
you know that's, it, that was my it, response to that person and and that it wasn't and that it wasn't like when i do that with my children my children know that they've done something wrong right as opposed to the person who's doing the thing wrong is the person raging out of control mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the child knows that the child knows that that like oh no that's the problem that's the problem is the person raging you know this is um I'm about to just section Strings, off, yeah. section off a, a little tail end at the end of the show. So it's going to be called Andrew's Corner because <laughs> I have one more thought I needed to say, but Please you guys go. are on such a flow that I didn't want to interrupt. Please go. But for reasons of my own that father know about, and it's not really a big deal, but um, you're talking about a lack of interga- uh, integration between people and wanting to, and it was this... Uh, I believe by Providence, a conversation happened where my wife and I had been talking about it, Then we ended up talking about it with someone who knew about it more. And then a guy that we know a lot about food, a guy who knows a lot about food got involved in the conversation. We were talking about dietary restrictions. And I was talking about like this whole idea of like, because I was like, why is suddenly gluten such a bad thing? And suddenly why is like, peanuts why does everybody have peanut allergies why is suddenly lactose like this big problem whatever that's a whole other thing that we can put aside for another time um but this woman that was talking to me was talking about how she's watching these bread documentaries and it was like talking and like this particular woman that was giving the documentary so it was a woman giving the documentary a woman watching it who's talking to me and the woman who's making the documentary is talking about like she's biblical so she's a biologist in some sense i can't remember i really should probably been more informed about this but the thought is there that she's talking about like christ is like i am the grain of life like i am the bread and like why is suddenly like gluten and meat and like milk and all this stuff is this problem to like it disrupts a meal it disrupts meals because like if you invite someone over who's like a vegan or a vegetarian or something like that bringing them now is complicated like bringing them over now is complicated and like i don't know and this is me just speculating so take this for the little little thought that it is but what is a sacrifice to a god you know or to god is but a meal having with the person there's an intimacy that's shared with people who are sitting down for to eat together and then having throwing a cog in that you know, just like throwing a cog into it to the point where it's like, where it's just a little bit complicated and, you know, God forgive me for all the times. Like the reason that I bring this up is because I've recently started eating meat again after a near like seven year misguided vegetarianism that like now I realize all the times it's made things really complicated for people. And like all the times that like, there's a lack of integration there. There's a lack of like, and not to mention the fasting, the actually fasting from me, as opposed to like, just like, oh, it's not really that big of a deal because I never really eat meat in the first place. But actually having to like take a break from it is like, oh, wow, this is actually a little bit harder. And there's a lack of integration. There's a lack of like community because now it's more difficult for me to just sit down and eat with people. Like, oh, do, do you do cheese? Like, I can't tell you how many times as a vegetarian, oh, you're vegan? It's like, no, 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 I'm just a vegetarian. It's like, well, why does it matter? It doesn't matter in the first place. Just give me the food that you're going to give me and eat what you're given. Eat what you're given, like, regardless. And like, being human. That one is huge. Yeah. Nutritional yeah. idolatry is mm-hmm. such a big idolatry right now. Mm-hmm. It, and it is so woke. Which is being human, right? It's not like, it, it yes. It gets at the core. It gets at the core of what it means to be human, right? And yeah. tradition tradition is about, re- at least at least in Acts, it's about removal of dietary restrictions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That the Lord is removing dietary wow. restrictions. That's right. From us. Like that's, that's right. the that's the covenant. That's the new covenant. So that's right. Going going against that is then that well, that's, that's right. to whom? To that's whom right. and for what? That's if right. God said you can eat it. If God revealed that you could eat it, right. to to whom are to whom are you who are you worshiping with your fast right now? Right, you know right. your permanent fast away from meat. Right, you know, I, the, hey, it's a great. But, you know what? I was I was there. Hey, I was wrong. I was there. 
That's the I cool did thing it. about being an Orthodox Christian is it doesn't have to go much more than I was wrong. What am right. I doing? Yeah, exactly. I was wrong for a long time. <laughs> like a weight lifts off. I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm wrong. It's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. if you got to live your life all the time thinking that you're right about everything. I, uh, I don't Hard envy life. you. I don't Hard envy life. you. Yeah. And, you know, far be it, you know, this is just me, but a long time ago, somebody asked Ad-Rock from Beastie Boys, Adam mm -hmm. Horowitz, isn't it a little bit hypocritical for you to now be progressive, air quotes, mm -hmm. about the mm -hmm. things that you feel now, such as feminism, blah, 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 quote, unquote, progressive, when you released one of the most misogynistic albums of all time, which is Licensed to Ill, he's like, well, sure, I guess I'd rather be a hypocrite than like a zombie. Like, I'd rather just be wrong later. Like, take that for what it is. I mean, I had to throw a Beastie Boys quote in there. But like, I mean, that's literally like, I'd rather just be wrong sometimes. It's just mm -hmm. it's better to just be wrong. So speaking of being wrong, this is my ending question. Okay. The flip side, what is a band or the band, if you want, that you are the most ashamed that you got into? You got really, like embarrassingly, like maybe like a year high school high school yearbook photo of you like having a band shot and you're like oh my gosh i can't believe i got so into that and i would vamp except i'm not sure i have my best answer my probably first... my, mine's mine's bone thugs and harmony for sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's a good one yeah. <laughs> that's 100 <laughs> percent. i would say 100%. the genre of dubstep I'm the most oh yeah into yeah like that yeah. like late 2000s like that really obnoxious like chugging monster energy drink like playing call of duty dubstep like I got into it for like three months yeah like, pretty hard who was the uh who was the uh that was like the second wave of dubstep it's I like also did not Skrillex. like that dubstep Skrillex that's Skrillex. who I was good of course that's who you, that's 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 I yeah. like I was into dubstep, like DJ Scream, Midnight Request Line, like the I know very first stuff that came out. Fantastic. Out yeah, I know. There's, fantastic. I'm talking about the wah, 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 like the like. No, no, really no, no. Bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Skrillex. Skrillex yeah. Skrillex, yeah. That, Skrillex. that was like. Oh. Yeah, that was like selling out, selling out arenas. When I was going to dubstep parties, there were like eight people, you know, at a side room somewhere in LA and it was like the smog parties, the old school smog parties. And it was like brilliant, like actually oh, like great. dub, like dub, but this is no, yeah. The Skrillex stuff was ridiculous. I would, I, and yeah, that, that actually takes a little bit for me to admit again, I was wrong. I was wrong. I just, I, it was just bad. Hey, it wasn't, and if it, if it's anything, it was a particularly dark time in my life that I talked about last week, but that music, that music is, um, it's associated with uh, just some it's bad bad. Times. Yeah, bad times. Yeah, it's bad. What and about you, Father? Like, Do you have one? Pretty religiously into um, Mudvayne. When I was younger. <laughs> Yikes. Wow. Yeah. Hey, I was wrong. Yeah. I got like really into them. Like they were one of my favorite bands when I was, I'm talking like 12, 13, 14. Yeah, I'm putting it out there. Wow. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, I, I, this is a this is the toughest one ever, man. Because it's like the only thing I can say is like maybe defaulting to an earlier question from another episode of like the closet band, which for me mm. I think I answered STP, but like. I was never like into STP though. Like that's, I don't, and this is tough because now I feel like I'm that guy who's like, oh, I've never been into anything that was bad. <laughs> that's, not what I'm, that's, that's not what I'm trying to say, but like everything I've been into, I'm just, I'm really trying to rack my brain because for me, it's like, well, it was, I, I'm not ashamed of any. So it's was like, oh, well, uh... I, I was into this because I started here, which led me to this, just led me to that. You know what I mean? It's like. Um, I mean, in that vein, Mud Vein led me to Dark Throne. To what? Because, like, to Dark Throne. Okay. 
Yeah, because I mean, in that vein, like, yeah, dubstep probably led nowhere because I just shut it off and I was like, and I've had a hard time with electronic music ever since, if you could call that electronic music. It's but electronic like, music, but it's pretty bad. But like, I pretty mean, bad. yeah, I listened to like American Hit Charge and Slipknot and Mudvayne, but that all led me to like really good music eventually. But I mean, I never, ever got into Disturbed. From the moment I heard that, that oh, wow, I, I was like, I'm out, I'm done. Like a m- bunch <laughs> of my buddies were getting into Disturbed and they're like, this is it. This album is amazing. I was like, let's hear it. And I heard that down with the, and I was like, I'm out. I don't like these guys. I don't like them at all. And um, I'm glad I dodged that bullet because I, I can, mean, I, I can proudly stand up and say to our 350 listener or viewers that I have never got into Disturbed. Like I, I could maybe the closest thing I could think of is like maybe POD, maybe. What is it? Like maybe P- I mean, like I'm just trying to find something so I don't seem like like a complete like arrogant <laughs> jerk. I mean, but I'm an arrogant jerk, okay? I'm I'm a terrible person, but like I'm like maybe pod i guess but like not really because i still like pod yeah because i don't think pod is that bad but i'm just like but it was it was that time of it was that time and you know like whatever but i'm like ah, like it wasn't really it was just a thing you know but i'm just and that's just me grasping for a straw because like i said i don't want to look like that i don't want to be that guy but I, <laughs> what about I from like a religious perspective what's a band that like you're afraid to have to give word for because I got a couple of those too. Well, I got a couple of those. In fact, you know, I just had a great. Um, I mean, we'll go there real quick because um, I'm actually really great for this, and I'm sure he won't mind. I had a really great experience with someone um, because there is a one. There is one band in particular where I'm like, you know, I'm repenting of it. So, anyways, like, um, good brother like I love him a lot like and it's it's you know it was a great moment of like the growth of our relationship you know but uh we're hanging out whatever blah blah and um you know out of just no fault of his own right no fault of his own but he um he wanted to you know do something nice for me and bless me and he he, he we were in a conversation talking about um Sam Hain of uh, the band which what band? Sorry, Sam Hain. So it's oh. the band that Glenn Danzig was. So Misfits, then yes. Sam Hain, then Danzig. Yes. And so, out of just you know, he just want to do something nice for me. He bought me, um, he got me some Sam Hain vinyl because we were talking in the context. I was oh. like, oh, you know, I was like talking about how like November coming fire is not impressed anymore. Is it pressed and like all this stuff, whatever you know. And so he did something very kind. And he, he bought me this vinyl, right? In particular, the first album, Initium. And so he got it for me. It was really kind, but like, I couldn't accept it. Yeah. And it was hard because I didn't want to offend him, but like, I could not accept it, right? I could not accept it because people can roll their eyes. I don't really care. But for me, that particular album was like, I, I can't. I can't have it because it, it's a gateway for me. And it, 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 like, it was a source of, anyways. So it was wonderful because I, you know, I had that hard conversation and said, look, thank you so much. I could, and it was great. I, I, it has strengthened our friendship and it strengthened our relationship as his priest. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's been, it's been an awesome thing. Like Romans 8, 28, all things work for good for those who love God and call his purposes. Like it was for us, in our relationship, this incredible moment of authenticity of like Christ comes first and like repentance and like my repentance isn't just something like, that was one of those moments where it was like, I can't be, I can't be a hypocrite and I can't be vain. And I can't care if that makes me look like I'm some small minded fundamentalist and I can't have a record. It's like, I can't talk about demonic offering and take this because that's what it is for me you you, you know what i'm saying like and so for so great story 
my brother, he knows who he is. I love you. It was great. It was, it's definitely a point where we will both look back and like, this is where we became really tight as, you know, brothers, as friends and, you know, spiritual father and, you know, spiritual son, like that's a moment, right? So that aside, something that I'm like, you know, I'll have to answer for is definitely like, it's so bad that um, and this is this is a cautionary tale for everyone else, right? Like, it's so bad that certain things will trigger, like certain words will, will be lyrics, and then the whole song will play. And the whole, there are certain songs that are actual, um, you know, invocations, and they will and they will play. You know what I mean? And and God has forgiven me and I'm repenting, but it's like, I have to also deal with the consequences of opening my soul up and yeah. allowing certain things to be in, imprinted there. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like, that's one of those ones where I'm like, you know, God, may God continue to purify me and have mercy on me, you know, but that's definitely one where I'm like, cause I, I, that's harnessed. I've, I have harnessed that energy for years and it's produced results for me and may God help me. You know what I'm saying? I, uh, I, it's not a war story thing, but it made me think, and I'll make it quick, but there's a black metal band I really loved. Like it, that, that was a hard one to let go of. Um, but there's a video in like the, in like the Illinois state building of them trying to like introduce like, um, uh, like a satanic something into like a crib. It was like an, Oh, the Baphomet. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, and, the ba baby Baphomet. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And there's the that. Catholics praying the rosary next to it. Yeah. Super wow video. Like, holy crap. Okay, wow. But they were, the Lucifer people were singing or chanting something. And it turns out that was one of the songs mm. that was this. So they were obviously reading from some kind of something, some kind of prayer book or whatever. And uh, then that was a band that I was listening to and they were doing that same thing, but it was in the form of, and I was just like, ooh, good. Yeah. Luckily I was not that into them. Be like, like, I loved them, but it was a couple months and I was like, I can't do this, this, this is no good. But um, the last thing I'll say is when my wife is having trouble getting out of bed in the morning, what I do is I take a Bluetooth speaker and I stick it on the corner of the door and I turn on disturbs cover of sound of silence <laughs> so that she's just sitting there with this song playing i'm like you can either get up and go <laughs> turn off the speaker and if that's the case but really what it looks like for her having a hard time getting out of bed is it's been about two minutes i'm really ready like to eat breakfast so it's not like she's laying there for just like you know a half hour or 45 minutes i'm just like all right let's go let's go let's go it's my equivalent of coming in and smashing the trash can lids together I was being like, I just turn on disturbed cover of Sound of Silence and stick it in the corner and say, you got to get up and turn it off. I'm going to go into another room now. So, and it works. So, because that's a really awful song. Just a really, <laughs> really awful, awful song. So, so with that, um, uh, we're still working on the Q&A. Uh, well, we've got some questions. Do you guys want to do the Q&A next week, maybe? I've got to, I've got questions. I'm going to send out an email to the list uh, telling everybody that if they want to send questions, they could just respond there. But we've got, we actually have some good ones where we could probably, could probably turn into about two hours, even off the three or four really good ones that I've got. They're, they're good. Like they're Great. good questions that people have submitted Great. already. So, I mean, yeah, we can, we can, we can talk, we can talk and talk. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm yeah. sure. No, they're deep. They're all, all of them are deep. They're okay. all deep. So yeah okay. very good okay coolio um but yeah keep submitting them to the or the the uh, landing page royalpath.network um it felt like that there was something else i needed to say but i can't remember um but yeah i can't remember that's that so anyway thank you guys have a good night bye